my friends, the great experiment. The crew doesn't hate the XO, then he's not doing his job. Good hunting is what you say. It's part of the pattern, part of the plan. Are they the lucky ones? That's what you're thinking, isn't it? Welcome to Greatest Trek and Hot Cylon Summer, the new Star Trek podcast that is uh, temporarily chewing its way through the first season of Battlestar Galactica. Madam Pranica. I'm Ben Harrison. Glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah, getting close to the end, that first season. How do you feel about it? I feel like it's a big accomplishment to get through an entire season of this. Um, it's definitely like putting old gray hair at the old temples. It's fucking stressful. Yeah, it is. It's a different vibe. It's funny. Like, uh, it doesn't quite work with the chill, hot Cylon summer vibe we're putting out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever think when you were designing hot Cylon summer, the beach towel, the hit beach towel at podshop.biz, <laughs> instead of doing like the cool pool shimmer, which I love, by the way, it looks awesome, just doing meat like mm. doing doing the pink title on top of meat. Dangling hoses of meat and yeah. squirting bile. Yeah. I mean, that's an alt. That's probably on one of the layers that, mm -hmm. you, that you turn invisible, right? Yeah. Are there any like Norwegian black metal crossover like beach enthusiasts, greatest Trek fans? Like I bet. Is yeah. that like a is that like a triangle or do you have to just pick two? FODs are Miriam. FODs that love black metal but hate Hot Cylon Summer, we got to put just the Greatest Trek logo over meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think meat towel exists. It's like, that be. has to be yeah. a thing. Yeah. Our uh, colleagues here at uh, MaximumFun.org, uh, Graham and Dave, of the uh, hilarious comedy podcast, Stop Podcasting Yourself, talk a lot about the phenomenon of the summer goth and and like what a difficult thing it is to maintain your goth lifestyle when the weather is making it really uncomfortable to wear lots of things. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be a problem. Yeah. It's going to make your eyeliner run. The summer gods are in our thoughts and prayers, but not represented well in our pod shop. A butcher in my neighborhood posted something recently. Uh, she's a big... Uh, sausage enthusiast she's the sausage maker of my neighborhood and she posted a thing of uh of someone going to an eastern block nail salon mm -hmm. showing a picture of cured meats and cured meats being put on her nails like like as a design oh wow like uh so like salami fingernail <laughs> for one and then I don't I'm I'm saying Italian ones. I'm sure that they have different ones in the Eastern Bloc, but prosciutto fingernail for number two. I mean, it looked like salami for me. It was all one type. It wasn't the it wasn't a charcuterie plate of nail art. There was a uniformity of sausage here across all the fingers. <laughs> okay. It was a delight. I had a friend in college who was a, a vegetarian for religious reasons. I think she was uh, a practicing Hindu. And she did study abroad in Russia, and she said that she basically had to take up smoking because she like it was the only way to suppress her appetite to the degree she needed it suppressed, given how much meat is in every dish. I mean, that and she looks fucking cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She, she looked rad as hell, but uh -huh. yeah, she... Like, she was like, a salad will just be like lunch meat tossed in, a, in an oil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is meat in the potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vitamin, what is? <laughs> yeah, it's a great look. Um, I think people should be getting hot silent summer nail art. I mean, given what a smash hit this situation has been. It's been a great thing. We have to come up with another project to fill six weeks in between hot silent summer yeah. and its end and the beginning of Lower Decks. And we're just racking our brains about what's going to fit neatly into six weeks. Because it's like Prodigy is there, but uh -huh. it's also like it feels like we will be building a head of steam on Prodigy just in time to take it out at the knees. We underserve Prodigy by just doing six of 20 episodes of it and then picking it up like in another six or 10 months. It's not fair. Prodigy deserves so much better. Yeah. 
Prodigy deserves uh, new teeth for Rock Talk. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of horrific dental situations. Yeah. <laughs> I bet Rock Talk would close the gap. Mm. Does Rock Talk have a gap? I, f- I feel like I've shut it out of my head. Rock Talk is oops all gaps. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that uh, Invisalign would actually work on a, a being made of rock, though? Like, or do you have to get tougher stuff, like titanium Invisalign or something? I mean, I guess it depends on on the movement of rock over mm. the period of years, yeah, or millennia. Yeah. You'd have to do those trays, but you need like millions of years worth of trays to affect <laughs> any movement, right? Oh, that's going to be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> From somebody who's being told this is going to take a year, I can tell you, that's going to be expensive. Oh, shit, Ben. I I forgot to wish you happy Colonial Day. Oh, uh, I don't celebrate Colonial Day. I uh, We've always observed Rex Manning Day in my mm. family. I heard you on the wireless back in 52. How about uh, Colonel Day, which is often a way that I say that word in my head in a weird dyslexic kind of colonel colonial switcheroo yeah i mean that's where the term colonel comes from right like a person doing a colonize oh yeah i guess so that's fucked up we should change that <laughs> let's see how this episode of battlestar galactica uh, explores that topic on today's episode of hot cylon summer season one episode 11 colonel day Kill me now. Mm. Turtle time. What do you think of the Cloud Nine luxury liner that we open the episode with? This thing, imagine you could be so unlucky at the end of humanity to be on a dipshit ship. Yeah. Like the water carrier ships. Like, that's all you do. You're just a water tank. You're the you're the Culligan man in the fleet. Or you could be on the luxury liner right you're fucking you're you're adam sandler's immortal character the water boy or you're living it up i love this place it's got what seems like artificial natural light how would you describe it like there seems to be a projection yeah but there also seems to be light coming through a barrier but there's limits to this yeah i mean this is something that uh is also just limited by the technology, I think. Like, yeah. they wanted to shoot some stuff outside, so they came up with a ship that's got a dome. And mm-hmm. when you see the wide shots, they're trying to make the case that the light is coming from very, very bright lights up on poles. But yeah. if it was, there wouldn't be, like, one single shadow falling on on people, you know? like Right. When you're in a room, it doesn't look like that. I think every season of a science fiction show you get to a certain episode in the year everyone deserves dome at some point right <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. here we are at episode 11 i mean what better way to celebrate colonel day than getting some dome i love the idea of the colonial gang being a very very close ripoff of mclaughlin group <laughs> issue one it's so fun we got a James McManus is the host, along with uh, Playa Palacios and Seku Hamilton. Here's the thing I really disliked about this show open for them. I don't like the host slapping another person's leg by way of introduction, you know? I don't like that either, and I don't like that they cheaped out on a table to broadcast from. Like, any time <laughs> you see a panel show. I mean, I guess the McLaughlin Group is an example of... A panel show where there isn't a table. Oh, there's a table, but, isn't but there? It, it's like a low table, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. Like seeing their legs was jarring to me because every political panel show that we have in our current day, I think, is set up to where the legs are not visible. And these people are just sitting on the edge of a fountain, like with their legs out there for the world to see. And uh, it just felt wrong. It felt sick and wrong. I got to believe with what remains of humanity, you know, there's that portion that represents the press and a portion of that 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 represents a press with the TV show. Right. Uh, you got to believe the ratings are very popular for the colonial gang, right? Oh, man. 
Yeah. And they're doing that kind of like their different perspectives from across the political spectrum. The hardest talk. Yeah. That's what I think. We learned that this uh, Cloud9 dome ship is going to be the site of a uh, very historic gathering of uh, all of the like political leaders. It's the Quorum of Twelve is the official name of the body, and they'll be uh, going through a whole bunch of hot button issues that are of pressing concern to the handful of humans left alive. Unclear, and I didn't count them, Ben. Maybe you did. How many issues they covered <laughs> per episode? It was only ever about four. Uh. On the McLaughlin group. I'm talking about for Colonial Gang, though. Yeah. It, this seems to be a show also. You hear snips of it throughout this episode of Battlestar Galactica. It just seems to be going live whenever it wants to go live. Right. Maybe you just tune into a radio frequency and uh, it's on or it's not. Well, or maybe it's like, you know, the NPR politics podcast, which will throw an emergency episode into the feed when something really big happens. And, you know, Colonial Day... They're just, it's all bonus episodes all the time. We on? Frank, we're on. Go, go. Easy to be distracted while listening to the Colonial Gang by the footage of a mysterious person loading a travel case with a firearm and a bunch of ammo. Yeah, this guy is uh, getting ready for something sinister. And it's it's shot in a way where you can't see his face. Uh, You can only see kind of his birdie and a little bit of the back of his hair and shot in a way that heavily hints at this being the Eric of Tom doing this gun loading and preparing Uh, because Tom's Eric is coming up a lot in political conversations as is Wally, a fatuous gas bag who's friends with uh, the president. When we meet over on colonial one, he's a, new to being famous, but he has had some important role in keeping the fleet together over the course of the 47 days or whatever since the end of the world. We're just now meeting Wallace Gray, uh, a person who seems to get on smashingly with President Roslin. They're they're great friends. Yeah. In the clear and present danger parlance, uh, the best friends, even. Lifelong friends. Nothing to report story. I was immediately suspicious of this guy because he just looked like what Charlie Kirk will look like in 35 years. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, he's been doing a great job. If I'm assistant cousin Greg, I want Wallace Gray to get the fuck out. Oh, because this guy comes in as like the senior advisor. Yeah. This guy's way above assistant cousin Greg. Assistant cousin Greg uh, wishes he could have the riz of a Wally Gray. No one in the room loves... I mean, they feel obligated to listen to an episode of The Colonial Gang. They don't like what they're hearing. They don't like the freedom of the press that much, even. A very sus take by uh, President Roslin here. I was like, ooh, I don't like that, President Roslin. I don't like like where your mind is headed. (laughs) It's one thing to be frustrated by somebody who has a difference of opinion from you or is criticizing you. It's another thing to like be like, well, maybe this right, maybe this sacrosanct right... (laughs) shouldn't exist because it doesn't affect me personally very well. Here's what's going on. This quorum of 12 needs to be convened and it is the legislative branch of the colonial government. Uh, It's going to happen on cloud nine and there just happens to be an opening. Yeah. And and Tom's Eric is going to be there. He is going to be representing Sagittarion And that is a source of great misgivings for everybody, which Tom Zarek only serves to enhance when he makes a fleet-wide broadcast about, uh, you know, like, (laughs) I like the idea that uh, he's like, well, I'm not going to be on camera for this, so I might as well do it in an extremely spooky room. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I like that a lot. With a bunch of, like, red light cast on me. He puts out this broadcast at hand. Uh, Nobody likes what they're hearing from him in the halls of power, uh, including Big Adama, who blows in a call to the president. It's like, so we should nip this in a bud, right? Like we should uh, get rid of him or, uh, you know, put him on a list so he can't travel between ships so that uh, there's no way he can 
possibly re- represent Sagittarion on cloud nine? I think part of the energy of this scene that that feels so unusual is that like everything Tom's Eric says in his message seems like fairly reasonable. Mm-hmm. We are told that he's a terrible person and a terrorist, and yet what he's saying doesn't seem too crazy. I mean, it's populist red meat. Right. It seems to get the attention of a lot of folks in the fleet who seem to think that he has some interesting ideas, at least. It's like there's this thing of the slippery slope fallacy, and yet these things that are like fairly innocuous by themselves always seem to come freighted with all of this authoritarian bullshit. So like, isn't a slippery slope a real thing? I mean, you can just see the the political commercials from here. Yeah. I mean, Tom Zarek has led a prison ship <laughs> for the last 30 days, a prison ship made up of, uh, I don't know, hundreds of people. What has President Roslin ever done? She's been uh, living in the lap of luxury over there on Colonial One. Yeah. We need to let this play out. After the theme, we're in Gaius Beltar's lab when Starbuck walks in. And I got to think that anytime anyone walks into Gaius Beltar's lab, you got to knock real loud, right? (laughs) You just aren't sure if you're going to walk in on a guy jacking it. Right. He should never do his work with his back toward the door to his lab, which he's done here. Ask anyone who's ever worked in a cubicle ever. Yeah. (laughs) You never want the monitor facing the door. No, it's bad. What are you doing? The fuck are you doing, Baltar? Yeah. Starbuck announces that she is going to be part of his detail when he goes over to Cloud9 to represent Caprica in this Quorum of Twelve. It seems like he has been nominated and elected to serve as this uh, representative without his knowledge. This is the first he's hearing about it. Is this some kind of joke? Guess you got the super genius vote. No accounting for taste. It's easy to forget that for 99% of the entire remaining fleet of humanity, very few know how weird Gaius Baltar is. Right. The majority of them view him as a genius and a hero. There are at least 49,000 people that don't know that he's constantly coming during work meetings. Yeah. Yeah, so what an interesting pairing to pair Starbuck and him when they go over to participate in the Quorum of Twelve activities. Yeah, and uh, pretty soon we're back over on Cloud Nine. Starbuck and Apollo are enjoying uh, pretending to be outside in a nice outdoor environment and uh, spraying each other with the hose and uh, letting the sun fall on their faces and stuff. Is this a moment that tells us once and for all that we're good on water, like we're not rationing anymore, because spraying a hose all willy-nilly makes it seem as though, or maybe that's a a, a gray water that they use just for agriculture Mm. that's maybe not drinkable. Something about the water spray just didn't hit right to me. I mean, you don't see a sign in the grass with its corners cut off that says, you know, recycled water in use, not for human consumption. (laughs) Where are those signs? Yeah. But Cylons, go ahead. We think you could probably take it. <laughs> yeah. You just see number six, like, scooping water out of a wagon rut into her mouth. Later on, there's a scene of a security theater where, uh, you know, there's a metal detector outside this event. And that case we saw in the cold open that you know has a gun inside. Yeah. It whisks right through. With its carrier. We keep uh, not seeing the face of this carrier. He's just yeah. got a dumpy suit on and a body type that is like, oh, like that could be Tom's Eric, or maybe mm-hmm. it's somebody else that is of a similar build or something. I had a problem with this case, Ben. I'm just going to say it right now. Like, this is a case for one use. You see a case like this, you know, handgun is inside. <laughs> yeah. Like the Halliburton briefcase always has like manicured wads of cash in it. And yeah. black, similar to Halliburton briefcase, always has disassembled gun and like extra clips and silencer in it. The details in science fiction shows, like those corners cut off of the pages of everything, 
really matter? And this is a moment I thought could constitute a missed opportunity. Like, give us give us just a little bit more world building through a really neat case. Mm-hmm. Here's my hunch about this. I think that making a an operable bag is actually pretty hard. Oh, yeah. And that's why you see so many just like pelican cases in sci-fi because it's like, oh, this looks like pretty futury and mm-hmm. we don't have to like engineer it at all. It just works. And yeah. And it's like distracting when you see like the other thing is like the containers that Festool tools come in. Mm-hmm. Like you see those in sci-fi all the time. They don't even bother to like yeah. paint them, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it's just like, oh, it's a gray box with like a bright green closure on it. And it just looks like a sci-fi thing already. So why do anything to it? And as far as off-the-shelf solutions go for a television budget, yeah, hard to do better than the hundred bucks you'd spend on a screen-ready prop like that. Yeah, and then you can return it to the store you bought it at after you shoot with it. Yeah. So uh, as we see this case go through security, we hear the press talking about the speculation over whether the president is going to snub Tom Zarek when he shows up to participate in this political meeting. That's when we like the camera finally pans up and we see the face of the guy carrying the briefcase and he's just like a totally forgettable white guy that is not Tom Zarek. Cut over to what seems like a kind of receiving line, a line that you'd see, you know, at a wedding or something. Right, or like graduation. The guests are rolling through and we got a Colonel Ty there. Colonel Ty doesn't shake Tom Zarek's hand, but Ellen sure does. Ellen shakes it hard. And that's because she's wanting to be a political player. She knows that by shaking his hand, she's going to get her picture in the paper. And that's going to do something for her. And maybe Colonel Ty. Yeah, she likes Tom Zarek for ultimately being in control of the fleet and uh, wants them as a couple to throw their lot in with him and has not discussed this beforehand with her husband. (laughs) I really love the take of Tom Zarek here once it becomes very clear that he's being flirted with either you know, socially or professionally. Like, the Richard Hatch look of like, oh, wow, she's like really coming on strong. But like, that he's trying to tamp that down a bit, Yeah, I thought was really cool. Yeah, it was good stuff. I like actors who try to act like they're not acting like something, Mm -hmm. and that's what's happening here. Yeah, around here, like somebody yells at Tom Zarek for being a terrorist, and then another guy who claims to be from Sagittarion comes to that guy's defense and we get like Apollo being a security guard a little bit. Mm -hmm. Seems like maybe you wouldn't want like one of the best pilots defending your fleet to be like potentially caught in a melee where he could be injured and not in a position to fly Vipers. Like maybe you give this job to a Marine or somebody else. I mean, I thought the same thing considering the attachment of Starbuck to Gaius Baltar, like a Starbuck who is definitely not 100, no. a Starbuck who is walking around with a cane. Yeah. And it's not even a cane that's like secretly a pump action shotgun or anything. It's just a cane. Security's going to be a bitch. How surprised were you that President Roslin did in fact shake Tom Zarek's hand? I guess I was only surprised in that they like turned it into a question. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, to whatever extent you can take a handshake and completely dissolve whatever importance could be conveyed from it. Like, it's almost a nothing handshake. Yeah, well, they're both very aware that there are a million eyeballs on them or a hundred thousand eyeballs on them, (laughs) more specifically. So it's a bit of a chess game between them. We get to see the inside of this meeting of the Quorum of Twelve. It's in process. Rosalind's at the podium. And uh, I love a sitting posture that Gaius Baltar has in a meeting. <laughs> like, just the drape of him. Mm-hmm. We know you're eating a hot dog. I'm not, sir. I'm just like the tiredest I've ever been in my life. Like a kid at a carpet store with his parents. (laughs) Just not 
into whatever's happening here. And number six is there to spice it up. She's like, hey, you know that reporter, Playa Palacios? She's being pretty flirty. And if you take the right angle, you can see just how flirty she is. You can uh, ply your trade with her. (laughs) Rosalind is at the podium, kind of expecting this meeting to be more or less routine. That routine is shattered when Tom Zarek grabs the mic and moves to add an agenda item. He points out that, uh, hey, we got no vice president here. Isn't that weird? Because if someone took a shot at President Roslin, all hell's going to break loose. What we need is a vice president, and we need that to be a priority right now. We need a designated survivor specifically, Mm -hmm. and... That terminology is very freighted when it is juxtaposed with shots of that briefcase coming into the room. Mm -hmm. The president is a little taken aback by this, and Baltar, who previously had his mind on the sexual opportunity he might have with this reporter lady, is suddenly getting prodded by six to second Tom Zarek's motion. And so he does. That's the fucking thing about the... Robert's rule of order or whatever Mm -hmm. is like it takes so little to affect a fucking line item in a meeting you just need a nomination in a second done done more like Robert's rules of disorder am I right (laughs) we'll be right back (laughs) the motion has been moved and seconded the idea of a Tom Zarek being up for VP, kind of a terrifying prospect, huh? And and on Colonial One, Rosalind and her group of advisors discusses what a fucking nightmare this is. Yeah, they are pretty much blindsided by what happened in that meeting, and he's going to be a candidate, and they're like, well, we just need to put up a different person that will snatch up all the votes really quickly because... like we cannot abide a future in which he is a heartbeat from the presidency. And, you know, like I think the key to locking up this vote is to appeal to the fatuous gas bag community. And uh, Wally, that's you. The, The fatuous gas bags love you, Wally. There's something so familiar over the course of the last 15 years of like, one political party getting behind uh, a very loud and interesting and some would say like populist oxygen grabbing figure. And then the other party going, no, like, let's just choose someone who could be anyone (laughs) safe, (laughs) uninteresting, whatever. Certainly the electorate will be able to tell the difference between these two, right? Like, oh, what a slow motion car crash this nomination of Wallace Gray is. Ugh. Well, viewers, if you were curious about what the political positions of Wally Gray versus Tom's Eric might be, this episode is going to make it very confusing (laughs) because we get an interview with Tom's Eric who's being followed around by the press as he marches aimlessly around cloud nine. And he's talking about how there's no money, so why is anybody getting up and doing their jobs anymore? Why are we cosplaying as though we have a society when we don't? What we need is money and incentives and jobs. But also then he's like, more collectivism and less individualism. And it's like, what are you, man? Are you a fucking communist? Or are you you trying to get money back going? I read that scene completely differently from you. I didn't think he was writing for the idea of money at all. I I thought his ideas were really interesting in the sense of like, wow, you know, uh, Caprica's gone and so is the idea of any of the institutions we've ever had and depended on. <laughs> now we're a very small collective. What do we do? He's sort of Tyler Durdening, like we got rid of the the record of who owes who what. So why, may, maybe we can start over. I mean, he's like, I think that 
that is in there, but I think that it is very complicated by the fact that he's saying like nobody has any reason to do any of the stuff that they're doing, which is a very capitalist argument. Like we need money as an incentive structure. And he points at like the Boothby of Battlestar Galactica, who's like doing some gardening. And he's like, what incentive does this man have to put his boots on and, and like do gardening? Well, when you put it that way. But I thought that his argument was for a socialism that he describes later on in the conversation. I didn't think it was an argument in favor of, of a monetary system being recreated and thus like a reason to do it. Like it seemed like the thrust of his argument in that spot was about like the benefit that one feels obligated to have when they put in hard work at a thing. Like, sure. like, why are we doing anything is a very interesting question. And I don't think it's a question that necessarily is tied to, we need to have money as a way to do it. I thought his whole point was like the collectivism of the surviving humans being in a better structure than just the, the zombification of the things that we used to do. I think he's I I think he is like trying to have both sides of his argument in a way that like might just be the writers waving their hands around like he has some nebulous political ideas and these are just like some broad strokes about what they are. It could also be like he is the kind of politician that claims big ideals and does that for the political expediency of like getting lots of people on his side when he doesn't actually believe them. But I think that, like, based on his actions, he does believe in a compensation structure, as we learn toward the end when he, like, is giving luxury vacations away to Ellen Ty for shaking his hand. So I think he's full of shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not, like, saying I agree with President Rosalind because she doesn't have any, like, political beliefs that are explicitly stated either. Well, it, it's easy to think that you know what's best for someone when you are a position of wealth and power and you're making decisions for the gardener, <laughs> you know? Speaking of political strife, Apollo gets in a great big bar fight with a that Sagittarian guy from earlier. I feel like we've been in this bar. I feel like everyone has been in this bar. The inside, outside hotel bar. Yeah, anybody that's like been to San Diego for a weekend has been in this bar. <laughs> Absolutely. It's perfectly pleasant. The drinks are fine. Yeah. The apps are fine. Yeah, you like feel a little bit shitty spending 15 bucks on jalapeno poppers of this caliber, but it's like, you know, everything is so like ambiently pleasant. I'm not going to be like that bent out of shape over it. Why is there a giant menu on the wall? <laughs> what kind of place is this? Your button, a slice of lemon in a green drink? People aren't going to be able to see the color of that bit. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know how current you are on Bar Rescue, Ben, but uh, I've read on Bar Rescue Reddit mm. that there's kind of been a big kerfluffle about Taffer not being on his own show anymore. Really? Like, He's not on every episode of the current season, and it's Danny Trejo, I guess, <laughs> that is subbed in for him. Weird. <laughs> and then he went on Instagram to post what we usually call a quad box apology, but it's like a very flowery explanation for like, yeah, you know, I'm still really in there as an executive producer, and I really, really care about Bar Rescue the show, but I'm just not going to be on every episode, and my health is fine, and there's nothing dramatic to be concerned about, but that's just the way it is. I mean... They do like 40 episodes a season of that show. And the travel schedule of that has got to be fucking brutal because they are like into a town. No one knows 50 bar experts who've won <laughs> cocktail competitions. <laughs> I know. Like they're into and out of those towns in like four days. So, yeah, he doesn't seem like a particularly swell guy, but I also don't blame him for not wanting to do that for the rest of his life. He's pretty old. <laughs> I love the idea of Taffer going, look, if it can't be me, we need someone who really brings the intimidation. <laughs> Less in a like barrel chested, swinging my arms, yelling at people kind of way, but a guy you just look at mm -hmm. and fear. 
Who yeah. do we got that fits that description? You know what I am. Ugly all day. Is Danny Trejo wearing the too big maroon sport coat in the in the episodes that he's on? God, please put Danny Trejo in John Taffer's <laughs> jackets. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a delight. So this bar fight pops off because of the prior friction between Apollo and this dude, but it starts to involve other Sagittarian guys, and Briefcase guy is there at the hotel bar with his briefcase open, and as Apollo and Starbuck are mixing it up with these two other patrons, is trying to like scramble to close his briefcase and get out of there. He trips and falls and the gun goes down on the floor and Starbuck clocks this and finishes off her guy, like kicks a bottle over to Apollo so he can smash the head of his guy. And she like hobbles after the potential gunman and gets him down with her walking stick, gets the gun and points it in his nose couple of details about this fight scene I really like are like the really, really long foreground background action shots of like, you've got your uh, your strange gunman in the foreground and then behind him, the cocktail table. And behind that, you got Starbuck with her cane, like trying to make it through. <laughs> like all that depth stuff is really fun. Yeah. But also getting hit with a bottle that doesn't break sounds so much more painful than one that does. Yeah. Like that first shot and that thunk. Ah! Oof. What the hell? That bottle does break eventually. Yeah. But man. Apollo's like, I loosened it for you. <laughs> I got hit with a thrown egg one time and that hurts so much. I can't even imagine how much it hurts to get hit with a bottle. I want to let that go so bad. Just uninterrogated. <laughs> FODs out there know why someone would throw an egg at Ben. <laughs> what the fuck? Why? I don't why would someone do that? I don't remember why. Uh, I can tell you he was a priest. <laughs> that checks out. Yeah. What do you think a priest keeps under all those robes? Just eggs. Lots of them. Dozens of eggs. <laughs> I mean, they're sitting in those pews laying eggs all day. Good protein. President Roslyn and her policies are all about holding on to a fantasy. We need to completely free ourselves of the past. Not put it in the way. We cut over to Caprica, and uh, Hilo and Boomer have made it to the outskirts of this big military base that they've been talking about going to to steal a ship. And um, it's daytime, so it's Mexico, but it's also raining. And they're going to get ready for it to be nighttime. So Boomer's like, hey, let's have a snack. And Hilo's like, no way, man. I'm still all up in my head about how we killed that lady. But then she was there with those toasters. Like, why would identical twin babes hang out with toasters. It doesn't make any sense. I love how fucking spot on Hilo is. Just speaking off the cuff, like, are the Cylons messing with human DNA? And are they actually Cylons that look human? And maybe there are a number of copies of just one kind? What would it mean? Is, is this close to getting it? I love that Hilo is kind of accidentally smart here. Mm -hmm. He's not supposed to be, but he gets it. He's like, I feel like I'm in a Coors commercial, man, but I don't love twins. We cut over to uh, another great interrogation scene with Starbuck playing the part of the interrogator and the dude with the gun case whose name is Valance as the interrogated. This guy is no Leo Ben Conroy in terms of even sticking to his story. Like he's, he's like, that's not my gun. Also, I carry a lot of cash and I need it for protection. He seems like someone who does in fact feel pain and does not have a switch to turn that off. <laughs> yeah, they didn't bring one of their specialized buckets over to the cloud nine. I love that Starbuck is quiet cop and Apollo is fucking loud cop. <laughs> Your friend Zarek pointed that out. Yeah, I always heard a 
careful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, but Starbuck proves him wrong, and they also disabuse this guy Valance of the idea that he is in some kind of police interrogation where he's going to get a phone call and a subsequent trial. Like they're like, no man, you're going to cooperate with us, or we're throwing you off the ship the hard way. It's so interesting how so many of these matters are happening simultaneously. Like Tom Zarek's description of what society is relative to an absent economy seems very related to where, where are we at with the rule of law here, <laughs> given our diminished numbers, and also a government functioning down the road right. on cloud nine trying to figure out whether or not it can be whole and in what way yeah. and in what way can represent the people that may or may not be voting for them. Like that all of this is happening simultaneously is really interesting. Yeah. Like are we habeas in corpuses or not? It's horrifying to think of a society with, with no protection under the law at all, but Starbuck isn't wrong to say that that does not exist right now. Yeah. They can't get anything out of Valence, and they report this back to Roslyn. And Apollo does not want her to be complacent about this. He's like, I'm sure that he's working with your potential vice president in Tom's Eric. Like, we got to take this like super duper seriously because he had some pretty sophisticated tech. Like when they described the the briefcase as having like special paddings and and the gun being made out of ceramic so that it wouldn't show up on the x-rays. It's pretty scary. And so the, the president authorizes him to just like put full-blown surveillance on Tom Zarek. Like he is, his phones are tapped, his broom is bugged. They're going to keep an eye on him wherever he goes. Back in the chamber where the quorum of 12 is convened, assistant cousin Greg and President Roslin discuss how is it that Tom Zarek has gotten all this support? Like, it's uncanny. The, the rest of the 12 fucking love this guy. Yeah. And that's because Tom Zarek has been hiring out his people on the prison ship to go be, like, the superintendents of the rest of the fleet. Like, you got something busted on your water ship? Check it out. I'll send you a plumber. And this has happened across the fleet. And all this has done has curried a bunch of favorable attitudes towards Tom Zarek. It's a really shrewd bit of business he's done. It doesn't seem like ACG is like trying to help. He's just reporting this to the president. Like he's not whipping votes or like going and talking to the delegates and saying like, what can we do to persuade you to come over to Wally Gray's way of thinking? Well, I mean, that seems to be Wallace Gray's job. I mean, if he's the senior yeah. assistant to the president. But all he's doing is like talking about housing and, and food and stuff. Like who gives a shit about any of that? I know. It seems like people are, are fine with housing and food in the <laughs> fleet at this point. So we cut over to that hotel bar and Ellen Ty is chilling there. Tom's Eric has just invited himself behind the bar and mixes her a drink because who gives a shit? Money doesn't matter. And neither do jobs. I fucking love this scene. He's like, anarchy doesn't have to be uh, violent and crazy. It can just be me behind the bar sometimes because I would like to serve drinks. It's neat. <laughs> the thing about Ellen Ty, though, is everything she says is so duplicitous. Mm-hmm. She's not there to enjoy a green drink with this guy. She's there to do that and find a friend who may be involved in the government at a fairly high level and get favors from that friend and do favors for that friend. It's really messed up that she can be like totally out of control with the way she drinks in one episode and like very much in control and like using drinking to get closer to political power in another episode. We see uh, Saul Tai a bunch in this episode. A man that we know has struggled with his abuse of alcohol. And doesn't it just feel like whenever you see his face, he's the sort of actor that can act drunk, but act drunk trying to act sober. <laughs> 
I feel like ever since Ellen has come back on on the scene, he has been working drunk because he's got that weird drunk expression on his face all the time. He always looks like he's uh, just like down the end of Johnny Carson's couch trying to hold it together and, uh, yeah. and get a good bon mot in often enough to earn his paycheck. Dream job. <laughs> so we cut to Valance and he's in the room he's being interrogated in and he's dead. Yeah. Cut wrists. Starbuck and Apollo roll up on him and they and they don't seem to understand how or why this happened. Yeah. Bad news. And I mean, he's like handcuffed too. So it like doesn't make it a lot of sense. This is reported to the president and she immediately suspects that Tom's Eric was behind this. Like this, this was not a, a guy that we believe was a suicide risk. This guy was offed because of what he knew and Tom's Eric needed him gone so that uh, he could keep pursuing political power. A lot of assumptions being made here about who killed Valance and why. And anyone who would do this to Valance could easily do it to President Roslin, right? Yeah. And it's like, who is the man who cut the wrists of Liberty Valance? Hmm. Indeed. <laughs> There's a scene here where the colonial gang interviews Gaius Baltar. And look at him. Coming to the defense of President Roslin by going on the attack at Tom Zarek, but also just being a really great orator for the pro President Roslin movement, the pro stability movement, the pro Gaius Baltar movement is what it sounds like. He's really great in this moment and speaking in the in the sort of sound bites that a press really loves to use and run with. Yeah, I mean he's not not being weird and distracted by six, but holds it together relatively well. And uh, nobody notices the little sticky wet spot in the front of his trousers. That ain't piss. That's got nothing to do with piss. This gets back to the president. She realizes that uh, the writing on the wall is uh, that Wally Gray has no shot at this VP role and she just can't afford that. So she's got two extremely shitty jobs to do. The first is asking Wally to resign from contention, which he does not take super great. He feels totally betrayed by this. And these two characters are close. I think that's what makes it hard, you know? Like, he had his hopes up that he was going to be a viable vice presidential candidate to a person that he really admired and liked. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, good for President Roslin for just, like, getting to the point Right. You know, taking him behind the woodshed and like hitting him with a shovel, like it's just done. Health reasons. Uh, fine, health reasons. In the next scene, we experience the second thing that President Roslin was not looking forward to. This occurs in a public restroom, a public restroom that is not searched by the security apparatus for President Roslin. She just goes in there and chats up Gaius Baltar. And she's like, hey, we've been uh, hearing the statements you've been making to the press. We're very impressed. You've got uh, a lot going for you. And we think that uh, you could be the next vice president. And he's very flattered, uh, very taken aback, very surprised by this. And agrees to uh, put his hat in the ring. And the second President Roslin walks out, we realize that he was smashing Playa Palacios in the public restroom. An extremely brave move to go into a restroom with this many stalls for a bathroom fuck. Like, yeah, I would go into a single for a bathroom fuck, but like even two stalls feels like you are throwing caution to the wind with your bathroom fuck. And this is like a dozen stall bathroom. Yeah, there's got to be a better place for this, given what we understand Cloud Nine to be as sort of a resort, yeah. hotel, bar situation. I mean, maybe it was urgent, you know. But we know this about Gaius Baltar. He he gets down to a lot of important, <laughs> weird business in all sorts of places. I don't think he thinks of places in the way that 
most people do. I guess, yeah, I guess it's like over the course of the last month and a half, his assessment of what is sufficiently private for a fuck is so degraded at this point that it could just literally be anywhere. I mean, just briefly running down the list of better places to fuck on cloud nine. I'm thinking like they don't have a combat information center that he can go to and be discreet. There's got to be a single stall bathroom off of that bar. You'd think. Right. Right. There's got to be a, uh, breast pumping room sure perhaps like the the nursing room that's got a lockable door yeah but maybe he gets off on on the danger you know yeah anyone could walk in he's like technically i was pumping my own milk in there (laughs) yeah so uh the votes get cast and it's so suspenseful it's six to five and then uh if it's a tie the president gets to uh I guess get involved in problem drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so uh we we get introduced for the first time ever to Vice President Dr. Gaius Baltar. And there's a great big party to celebrate this that is also the Rex Manning Day party. I heard you on the wireless back in 52. <laughs> Everybody's there in their finery. Mm-hmm. Starbuck is, uh, has uh, put on a dress. She looks great. Uh, has really turned the, the head of Apollo. In a companion scene to the one we didn't talk about earlier, where, th- where they both reek after their bar fight, <laughs> and Apollo absolutely kicks her lady nuts about her being uh, kind of a pig pen <laughs> about her hygiene. Yeah. You have hygiene? Tom's Eric does sort of like a game recognize game moment with uh, the president and also divulges a Leopin Conroy level twist for the president to figure out, which is that he didn't kill Liberty Valance. Somebody else did. Yeah. But who? We don't know that yet. I don't know. Probably Big Adama. Feels like it makes sense. I mean, because that's who we see next in this scene. Commander Adama, he's at the party? Whoa! Yeah. And he's in a dress uniform? Whoa! And he he kind of like dances with the president figuratively before he does it literally. Like they have a little little conversation about the relative dangers of war and politics. Dr. Balter, interesting choice. I mean, it's interesting that Roslyn quotes the whole keep your enemies close line and then goes off to dance with him. Hmm. It makes me wonder what their relationship is at this point. W slash R slash T enemies and closeness. How confident is she that Baltar's Cylon detector actually works? Yeah. I mean, there's like a recency bias here that I think you have to have. Like, what have you invented for me lately? (laughs) <laughs> that actually works. That's provable. Yeah. We learn that Ellen Ty has uh, secured a all expenses paid luxury vacation for her and her husband through the largesse of Tom's Eric. And he doesn't know that, but she does. Which kind of means that maybe Ellen Ty killed Valance? I guess maybe. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, because he was asking her to, like, figure out where he was, right? Yeah. Hmm. I just don't like the idea of a highly placed government official accepting a gift like this from, uh, you know, somebody that has business before the quorum of 12. Who is going to sit Colonel Ty down and do an intervention about Ellen? She's bad for you, man. It's so hard when it's a relationship, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yet Saul needs that badly. He doesn't have the strength to do it himself. At this point, I'm like, why are there five more minutes left in this episode? Can this be over? And we cut back to Caprica, where they're doing their extremely shitty day for night. And Hilo and Boomer are now storming this base and sneaking around. And they see a couple of sixes, and they're like, They are very close to where the sixes are standing, but up high looking down on them. 
And then Hilo kind of uh, sidles around a corner on this ledge that he's standing on and sees another boomer walking around. I love that he's made <laughs> by that boomer. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously she sees a Hilo standing on that ledge on the side of a building, like fairly obvious. Yeah. Out in the open. We get some boomer on boomer crime here when flight suit boomer shoots civilian garb boomer a bunch of times in the chest with a gun that like does not make enough noise to cause any kind of alarm to go up at the uh, military installation. Are there Battlestar Galactica action figures? And if there are, are there many, many boomers and sixes <laughs> or do they just outfits? come with different outfits oh yeah uh i'm gonna look for that at a at the next convention i go to yeah i guess um i mean there were cylon toys when i was uh making the the graphic for hot cylon summer i ordered a, mm. a cylon toy but i think it was an old one because it like when i took it out of the package it was like there were like foam parts of it and the foam had totally rotted away <laughs> mm. so weird yeah i think it was like kind of a vintagey item that I probably destroyed the resale value of. <laughs> Interesting detail at the very end of this episode. So Boomer, three shots, takes other Boomer down across the plaza. And Hilo finally puts it together. And he starts running. And Boomer, for all of her strength and endurance, does not chase after him. Yeah. I thought that was a fascinating choice. But calls after him. Yeah. Yeah. That's the end of the episode. Did you like it, Ben? So say we all. So say we all. Uh, uh, I mean, I feel like there's like important plot twists in this, but it did feel a little like fillery in a way. Like, I feel like it could have been a half hour and we would have gotten everything we needed out of it. To me, this feels like a writer's room that is very concerned about how they're going to do the two-parter that ends the season. And this just needs to get some stuff done to set them up for that in a way that doesn't feel like it uh, it was really successful on its own right as an episode. How about you? I mean, it definitely feels like it, like the sort of episode in a longer season that needs to expand the universe as we know it yeah. and make space for the sort of conflicts to come later. And I like that we're starting to see this greater population of the survivors of humanity have different takes about how the future should be. And I like that there's some natural conflict about that. There's a very real feeling of dread about this. Like there's a real, there's an election coming in six months and Rosalind seems fairly confident that that she's got this in the bag. But all we ever see her do is the sort of press conference where she's explaining or describing a disaster that's happened and how the colonial government is going to respond. Meanwhile, we've got a Tom Zarek out there who doesn't have to do that kind of press conference. He can just go out there and share the big ideas or the big questions. Yeah. And that makes him a really interesting... Uh, foil for her going forward I, I think that part of it's interesting I like the world building that happened here I'm with you like it's a little bit fillery because the main conflict in the episode feels very familiar like stranger danger <laughs> trying to kill someone Yeah, we interrogated him like that's a bit of a retread but everything else the episode did I thought felt necessary well uh, do you want to see if there's anything necessary in the priority one inbox Nothing could feel more necessary than that. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secure channel. Got a priority one message here from NC FODs and book loving FODs. Also the third two. And it is to Apers on the Discord. Appers? A Pers? The, the pronunciation guide, not helpful. <laughs> we ask for pronunciation help. Uh, in the messages, and this one just says, A purrs is A hyphen purrs. So here's that message. Hot Cylon Summer, more like host Apers Summer. Just wanted to shout out Apers on the Discords. Which cord? 
Discord for hosting FODs local to NC and many get-togethers this summer. For bonuses, Apers also hosts a book club on the Discord. What a stellar crew member. Thanks, Apers. Wow. And I really hope that uh, my shot at pronouncing that is correct and not just a mispronunciation over and over again. I thought it had real plausibility as a choice. I hope so. Yeah. Gave it my best. I love this. Just shouting out another FOD for being a cool community member. That rules. And doing tons of shit. Yeah. Way to go, Apers. Uh, Our next Priority One message is from Captain Liz Soto and the Dith. And it's to Adam and Ben and all STLV FODs. Goes like this. Remember STLV? Remember the time the Dith threw dice with the skills of data? Remember stretching with Bev and Deanna? You're welcome. Shout out to STLV FODs and the one lamp and weird hotel room floor stains slash sex window. Thanks for making our first con amazing. Thanks for making our con amazing. Had a great time at STLV with Captain Lesoto and the Dith, and I want to thank the Dith especially. Special shout out to her for uh, the way she threw those bones at a craps (laughs) table where we all played at the Planet Hollywood. That was big fun. Oh, man. Uh, So many great FOTs, but uh, I feel like I we've met Captain Lesoto and the Dith in person many times. Yeah, and also yeah. seen many P ones, but I like I I hadn't totally connected the faces with the names until this STLV, and it was a, a total pleasure getting to know them a little bit better. Yeah, big fun. Glad we got to do that. Yeah, thank you uh, to everyone who got a P one, and uh, if you'd like to get one, head to maximumfun.org/jumbotron. Uh, we sure appreciate it. Hey Ben, what's that, Adam? In this episode of Battlestar Galactica, did you find yourself an Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin. I'm going to give it to Playa Palacios for the ruffledness look that she has when she comes out of the uh, bathroom stall. I think that, uh, you know, there's just a great, like a trope that I always enjoy. Like, how are they going to make a person look like they have recently been fucking and uh, I would say that they went like three ticks too far with her. Like she is so must up. She's been standing alone in that stall the entire time. Like she could have smoothed her hair down or tucked her shirt in a little bit. And she comes out just looking fucked up. <laughs> right. But the thing about a bathroom fuck is that it's so uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're really trying to make do in there. And you're going to emerge with the sort of bathroom rumple. <laughs> That's a part of it. Yeah. That has to be a part of it. Yeah. So uh, that made me laugh. I thought it was funny. There was also just a tension in that scene because she comes out and we see her talk to Baltar about like what a big deal this is. And then like, you know, it's kind of funny, like for the rest of the episode, like she seems to be sort of playing it in the press, like he would be a great choice. But when that scene opened, there were like a couple of heavily armed Marines standing at the door of the bathroom. And I guess they left with the president. Like they weren't they weren't Baltar's detail, but like we never got the cut back to that angle to establish that there were no more Marines in there. Right. So there was a a funny tension of like, are there just two Marines who are like keeping this secret for them? Uh, <laughs> or what? So yeah, Playa Palacios, my Edward Larkin. How about you? This feels too easy, but the physical acting that James Callis does as Gaius Baltar in the chamber for the Quorum of Twelve, there's a choice he makes that I thought was really funny, which is he slumped over his desk mm-hmm. in such a way that puts the microphone very far away from him because in his internal logic, he's not going to participate th- in this. He's bored by it. He's maybe going to get a little shut-eye. Yeah. And like the moment that Six prods him into participating, he's so unable to participate, (laughs) like due to the choices he's made, like he's basically two big steps away from the mic. And when he like leans over to second, I just thought that was great. Like that scene could have gone a whole bunch of ways to demonstrate what a dipshit he is. (laughs) But I really love that 
about him in this scene. So he's going to get my vote for an Edward Lark in this episode. I like it. Let's talk about next week's episode. It's going to be season one, episode 12, Cobol's Last Gleaming, part one. Hmm. Colonial raptors locate the planet Cobol, legendary birthplace of man. Laura and Adama battle over the benefits and dangers in unlocking Cobol's ancient mysteries. Laura's President Roslin? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Weirdly written. (laughs) It's like, you know, female politicians, they just get called by their first name to rob them of their agency. I'm glad that this is going to be the story for the next episode because I have thought about for a long time, where exactly are they jumping and why at this point? Yeah. Like I know the the essential why is to constantly flee the Cylons, but they're also looking for Earth. Yeah. Because of what Adama says. There have been no reminders of that since he said that. Are they checking boxes? Like is there a system in place of why they're jumping and when? Like I kind of want to know more about the reasons for the directions they're going or if they just found Cobol out of sheer luck. Yeah, the geography of this show is so meaningless at this point. Uh, It will be interesting to see them start to undergird some of that. I want some meaning. Yeah. Well, uh, that will be next week's episode. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Should we close out with a warning boom? What do you say? Well, I'll second that, Ben. That's what I'll do. Maybe we should try to get a third. Wendy, do you third that? Should we just do it anyways? Yeah. Ben, warning boys are a great way to get the word out about the programs that we do. Greatest Gen and Greatest Trek. Always looking for folks who could get on our level comedically. We don't want the folks who don't like what we do. Get out of here. Get out of here. And that's what a warning boy does. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning boys. An emergency buoy. A warning boy. Here's a five-star review for Greatest Trek on Apple Podcasts. Okay. It's from ReconBot. Headline, the perfect way to get more Trek after you watch all of Trek. I've been listening to Admiral Ben and Ensign Adam for, God damn it, this again? (laughs) Jesus. I like it. For like almost a decade now. Jesus Christ, that's a long time. That is a long time. They went from filled nerds to professional podcasters and... You get to go on that journey, too. They're funny, insightful, and I only rarely get upset at them and yell at my phone. (laughs) Can't do better than that. Would order again. Yeah. That puts it in a way that works, I think, as a warning bois. I think so, yeah. I appreciate uh, the way you put that, Recon, but I don't appreciate being reminded that we've done almost 10 years of this. (laughs) I know. What the hell? (laughs) Uh, We've got... 10 more. I think we're at the halfway point of whatever this is that we're doing. Wow. Before I hang up my headphones. <laughs> uh, may that day never come. <laughs> Thank you, Recon Bot. And thanks to everyone who leaves a nice review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use or recommends the show on social media. A uh, great way to get your words flying out of our mouth on an upcoming warning bois. If you don't know what to write for a review, just write down your favorite episode. That's usually a great entry point for uh, the uninitiated. Yeah, that's also a great way to post about the show. Mm -hmm. With that, we will be back at you next time with another great episode of Battlestar Galactica and an episode of Hot Cylon Summer that uh, is what so proudly we hailed. Hmm, I like that. Take it away, Wendy. Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty. Next week on Hot Cylon Summer, it's Season 1, Episode 12 of Battlestar Galactica, Cobal's Last Gleaming, Part 1. As always, we want to say a big thank you to the Maximum members who keep this show going by pitching in on a monthly basis. Members get instant access to the entire back catalog of bonus content, and you can set it up in just a couple of minutes at MaximumFun.org join. 
There are also free ways to support, like subscribing to the Greatest Trek YouTube channel or leaving a five-star rating and review on your podcatcher. You can also just recommend us to someone that you know. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Nick Dittmore, who created the show art, and Adam Ragusea, who composed the theme music. Thank you to Bill Tilly and Rob Adler for all their work keeping things fun for FODs online. You can find our social media pages under the handle at Greatest Trek and use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you post about the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows supported directly by you.